<laughs> Howard, did I get it right? <laughs> well, welcome to the Honolulu Hilton. And the uh, concierge wanted everyone to know that the pineapple throwing contest will be at 8 or the and the boat trip to Kauai will, will be an hour later after that. But welcome everybody. I'm glad you're here to hear the words from our very special guest. Uh, we have a partly we have a luncheon group that meets uh, sporadically and. Uh, uh, it's comprised of reformed sports broadcasters and sports uh, writers. And we have a third member of that group here I'd like to introduce, Dan Lovett. Dan, would you stand? Mm -hmm. uh, Dan came a long time ago from Idaho to Houston uh, in a covered wagon. <laughs> K-I-L-T. We were talking at the table, his hair was too great for radio, so he went to Channel 13. And in about 1973, he was recruited by ABC in Washington and then ABC in New York. And, and uh, now is retired, and semi-retired in Houston. And he's uh, found Christ late in his life and is actively involved in a ministry and, uh, to, uh, to African orphans, and they maintain an orphanage. So, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to tell you about, the, this is long before any of us had wrinkles, the Houston Chronicle ran a guest column in the Monday sports section, and often that responsibility, the responsibility fell to me. And the, the guest columns came from several, actually two main formats. Normally, a writer on the staff would interview this, this famous person, and then take the interview into written form, column form, and have the subject edit the, uh, the, the uh, content. And then occasionally, someone would ask, ask to write the column himself, sometimes herself, usually himself. And it would, it would come back with subject predicate disagreements, superfluous adjectives, meandering sentences that you needed to address to read. And those were the good parts. <laughs> we had to rewrite them. And uh, I asked Larry to do a column years ago. It had to be years ago. And uh, I thought, oh, here we go again. He wants to write his own column. And it came back. It's the only guest column in Houston Chronicle history that received no edit marks. It was this magnificently organized three-part guest column about, uh, about Larry's career. The beginning when he came to pitch for the Houston Colt 45s at age 18, and he was pure talent and no wisdom. And then phase two, when he was still very talented and had the seasoning of an experienced pitcher. And then phase three, when the talent had lessened and it was all seasoning and wisdom and knowing where to put the ball and to whom he was pitching. It was it was just a magnificent article. It really speaks well for the diversity of this man's life and the, the variety of his accomplishments. Uh, he uh, pretends to be a good golfer, but everything else is a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> he, has written, he has written a musical. He's working on. Um, he's working on a novel. He uh, is one of the most intelligent and insightful sports broadcasters uh, as a color analyst of any sport, uh, and. Uh, I wish the Astros would would see fit to use him because he brings you into the game. And you know, when you're born intelligent, it's for a long time. And his native intelligence helps, but he can put it into language that anyone can understand. And he never makes, I won't mention the gentleman's name, but Larry never made these goofs like the famous San Diego broadcaster who once told his audience, there's a deep drive to center field and the center field is going back. No, no. His head crashes into the wall, and and, and, and it's rolling towards second base. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking forward to what Larry Durker has, has to say. This 18-year-old phenom of the Colt 45s, the first Astros pitcher 
or Colt 45's pitcher to win 20 games, which for the non-baseball people is the mountaintop for a pitcher. Larry Durger. Yeah. Well, thank you, Hal. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things you have to learn when you embark on a professional sports career is how to get al along with the journalists. And uh, you can make a few mistakes there and, and learn a few lessons because what gets in the paper the next day may not be what you thought you said. So you have to be careful. But I would say I see all the Hawaiian shirts. Aloha. Aloha. Do you know what that really means? Do you, do you know how, what the definition of aloha is in Hawaiian? Because I think it fits this group very well. Not just because we have some people here that are seniors, because even if we had kids, it would fit very well. It's not only hello in a friendly way and goodbye in a friendly way, but it also means love. And so for me, aloha is the perfect word. And that's not why I ended up wearing a Hawaiian shirt tonight or becoming known as the Hawaiian shirt guy. Uh, that goes back a little further. Uh, in fact, it goes back to a time when the Astros were struggling. And they weren't struggling. <laughs> <laughs> Not like they are now. <laughs> they were struggling at a specific moment, which is the worst possible time that you can get into a slump, which is September when you're in the pennant race. And I was broadcasting at the time, it was 1996, and the Astros were neck and neck with the Cardinals, and we lost a couple of games here, and then lost a four-game series in Denver. We lost six straight games. We went into uh, Miami to play the Marlins. Had a four-game set there. We lost the first two. In the middle of that second game, we lost eight in a row, I think, uh, and we dropped back to six or seven games out, and there were only two weeks left. I mean, we literally had just coughed up any chance to get in the playoffs. And so about halfway through that game, the camera panned the dugout. And all the guys in the dugout had their heads looking down at their feet, had their hand in their head. And I, I was working with Bill Brown, and I said, Brownie, you know what's wrong with this team? He said, we're not hitting. <laughs> I said, yeah, but it's more than that. Well, what is it then? I said, not enough Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> and he said, what? I don't know how that came into my head. I literally do not know how that sentence came into my head, but it changed my life. He said, well, where's your Hawaiian shirt then? And I said, oh, I'll, I'll wear it tomorrow. I didn't have a Hawaiian shirt at that time. So I went to a mall in, 19, in September of 1996 in Miami, Florida, went through all the department stores and all the specialty clothing stores, and I couldn't find one single Hawaiian shirt. That's how unpopular and out of style they were in 1996, even in Miami. I did find a shirt with a couple of flowers on it, and so I wore that. And so the next night, we lost again, and during the game, we talked a little bit about the Hawaiian shirts. At this time, as a broadcaster, you just want the season to end. You know you've, you've, you've tried so hard so long to get in the playoffs, and you can just see that it's slipped away, and it's already slipped away, but you've still got 10 or 12 more games that you have to play, and if it's your job, you have to try to make the games entertaining. And so we kidded around about Hawaiian shirts quite a bit, you know, trying to defer the attention away from the team and, and what was happening, just the same way that these guys are trying to do now. I mean, you really have to earn your money when, when the team uh, is unpopular. And so 
we went to Atlanta, and I think the streak uh, reached 12 straight games, which is a team record. I think we might have broken that last year. <laughs> In fact, I think we lost more than that many games at the end of last year. It might be a streak still in progress. <laughs> but anyway, when we got home, a couple of fans came up and, and brought me Hawaiian shirts. And I had called my brother from Atlanta, and I had a couple of Hawaiian shirts that he overnighted to me. And uh, so I went out to the ballpark one day, and it was at a time when I was doing the, home, the road games on TV with Bill Brown and the home games on radio with Milo Hamilton. And so uh, I had this Hawaiian shirt on that my brother gave me, and it had a lot of these Woody station wagons on it with the surfboards coming out the back window and everything like that. And so I was sitting there preparing my scorebook an hour before the game, and I got this devilish thought. I'm going to get Milo tonight. So I told the other, the interns and the radio engineer, I said, wait till about the third inning, you know, once he's finished setting the stage and everything. They said, okay. So I said, Milo, uh, you know what this is? I pointed to the Woody station wagon on my shirt. And uh, he said, oh, station wagon? I said, yeah, it's a station wagon. but." It's also a Woody. You know, this was the most, when I was growing up in Southern California in the 50s and 60s, it was a surfer car. It was so popular. Um, you know, it, it was more than just a station wagon. It was a Woody. He said, well, I didn't, you know, I grew up in Iowa. I didn't know they called them that. He said, well, yeah, they do. And so now you have to um, put yourself in the right place. You're not watching the game. You're in your garage refinishing some furniture with the radio on, or maybe you're driving across Houston from one place to another. You're listening to the radio, but you're not watching anything, and you're hearing just hearing people talk. And so it gets to about the third inning, and I say, I think somebody went out to visit the pitcher, and I knew I had a little time, and I said, Milo, uh, how do you like my new Hawaiian shirt? Well. I've messed this up, I didn't set it up properly because uh, I have to consider my audience. There probably are, you know, maybe two or three people in this audience that didn't know that the word Woody had another slang interpretation which was much more popular um, at that point in time than the station wagon. And that was that a Woody was a slang term for an erection. <laughs> so I say, Milo, how do you like my new uh, Hawaiian shirt? You mean the one with all the woodies on it? <laughs> I said, yeah, when you were a young man, did, did you ever have a woody? He said, no, no, we were much too poor. <laughs> So I said, boy, that's really poor. <laughs> and he never had a clue. The people in the back of the radio booth were running out into the hall because they were afraid they'd laugh so hard it would come out over the air. The radio engineer was like, <laughs> like this. And we got through that inning, and we went on. Of course, everybody in the Astrodome that worked for the Astros heard about it the next day. Everybody's laughing, and Milo still doesn't. It was a year later before he realized what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> so that was part of the Hawaiian shirt story, but then after that, people would ask me about it and say, what is it that you like about Hawaiian shirts? And I'd say, well, have you ever seen anybody wearing a Hawaiian shirt that wasn't having a good time? I'd say, well, that's a good point. I think that that's part of how I became the manager of the Astros. After the season was over, about a week later, I got a call from Tal Smith. Could I come and talk to him in his office? Well, he had done this before, both at the Astrodome and in his office. Just try to pick my brain. What do you see in the team? What could we do this winter to, to get better? You know, our pitching, have you seen anything about our pitching? That's 
been our biggest problem. And we talked about the team for about 45 minutes. And I looked out the suite. He, he was in the gallery. He had some offices up there. And I looked through the glass door, and Jerry Hunsicker, the general manager, was walking around out there. And he said, I've asked, him. oh, you see, Jerry, Jerry, come on. So Jerry came in. He said, Tal said, I've uh, taken the liberty to order some sandwiches up. We're going to have some lunch here. Jerry would like to participate in this discussion, too. So we talked about the team some more. And then I looked through those doors, and Drayton McLean was walking around out there. And I said, something is going on here, <laughs> because this is not what I thought it was going to be. And when I saw Drayton, I realized it could be that they're going to let Terry Collins go, and that they're going to ask me who they should hire, or if I wanted to do it. So at that point, I had a clue. And Drayton came in, and from the tone of his questions and tenor of them, the direction he was taking, I knew they were going to ask me. And at that moment, I felt like if I decline, I'll really be chickening out. It'll really be a go against everything that I've ever believed in, which is one of the reasons I was able to pitch when I was 18, and that is that you should accept challenges and go forth prepared and with confidence. And so I thought if they asked me, even though I hadn't managed in the minor leagues, coached in the major leagues, I hadn't even coached any of my kids' teams because I was always busy with the playing and the announcing, I had never coached at all. And I thought if they asked me, I'm going to say yes unless she says no. Could you stand up, Judy? It's my wife, Judy. So I got home and she said, well, I, I guess they finally realized how much you're worth and what you can do, which was the perfect answer because it gave me a little more confidence. And uh, so we went out to watch our son play that night. Uh, they told me the press conference was going to be the next day. We watched with all the parents and uh, the next morning and they had a press conference and they announced that I was going to be the next manager. And the next night we went back to the same um, fields and uh, I started signing autographs before the game and people came from five fields away <laughs> and I signed autographs for an hour and I w went, well, wait a minute, I was just here last night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, things really changed. In fact, it reminded me uh, of something that a kid said to me in Philadelphia, we got off the team bus, and my career was over relatively early. I was 31, and I was an announcer right away, so I was younger than some of our players. And when I got off the team bus, the kids standing for autographs, uh, one of the kids said, didn't, didn't you used to be somebody? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, you know, I signed a couple autographs, went, went on into the stadium. I told that story to our broadcast director at the time, and he got a big laugh out of it. So I went back the next day after it was, I was going to be a manager after I went out to the field and signed autographs again, and I told him that story, and I said, Jamie, you know what? I used to be somebody, and now I'm somebody again. No, then I was nobody. I was somebody for a while, then I was nobody, and now I'm somebody again. So it's interesting, you know, in the public spotlight, how your image changes and what that means to your life. I've been, um, I've been trying not to talk too much about the Astros, and I have endeavored to, uh, to be able to recite Casey at the bat because I think uh, that this particular audience could appreciate it, and uh, also because. I've always got, an, and I just always have a, a way of wanting to do something a little bit different or twist something or play a mind game or do something that will make you think. And the thing that I, I want you to think about as I'm talking about what happened to the Casey and um, the Mudville team, uh, 
is that what happened on that day could never happen today. It would be impossible for what happened in that game to happen today. Now, I've got a book here. It's got some of the stories I wrote for the baseball library when I was doing radio. It's a very nice little thing. It's illustrated by a friend of mine, and it's got a lot of fun stories. And uh, after I finish, uh, whoever can tell me why it couldn't happen today, what happened back then, in 1888, when Ernest Thayer wrote the poem, well then you, you will go home with this. The, out, the outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville nine that day. The score was four to two with but an inning left to play. Edwin Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same. A sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair the rest clung to that hope that springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake. And the former was a Lulu, and the latter was a cake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake the much despised tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and the men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second and Flynn a hug in third. Then from 5,000 throats and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley and rattled in the dell. It knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat for Casey. Mighty Casey was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat no stranger in the crowd could doubt, twas Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him when he rubbed his hands in dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. And while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people there arose a muffled roar like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity did Casey's visage shone. He stilled the mighty tumult and bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher and once more the spheroid flew, but Casey just ignored it, and the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, fraud. But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face go stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball. And now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright, 
A band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light, and somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no doubt, there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. <laughs> Why couldn't that happen today? You got it. What was it? <clears throat> first, second, and third. First you got a man on second and third. Casey was built up to be ten times Babe Ruth. If the manager didn't walk him, he'd be fired today. There you go, Lance. <laughs> Come on, I'm going to answer some questions. Here, hand it to him. How much time have we got? Robert, thank, I meant to thank you for inviting me. So do we have any more time at all? Five minutes or something like that? Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Sure. Uh, when you came out of high school and, and were drafted in 1964 and came and pitched in September on your birthday, how much were you signed? In 1964, at the age of 17, I conducted the mo most successful negotiation that I have ever uh, done in my life. And uh, all I had to do uh, to win that deal was to promise the scout from the Cubs that I wouldn't sign until I talked to him tomorrow because he offered me $30,000 and he said, I think the Colt 45s are going to offer you more. And uh, I'm going to call Chicago and try to get them to let me offer you a little bit more too because we really need you and we, I think you should play for us. We're going to be a great team. We're coming up and you could be there pretty quick. And so I said, okay, Mr. Henley, I won't sign on, uh, with the Code 45s. I won't do anything until uh, I, t I talk to you tomorrow. So the Code 45s called and they offered me 35 and I went, oh, well, that's good. But I, I told him I can't really sign until tomorrow because I, I promised Mr. Hanley that I wouldn't sign, you know, in, until he called Chicago to see if they could offer me more money. So Cold 45's called a half an hour later and offered me 40. <laughs> By 11 o'clock that night, it was up to $55,000. <laughs> it finally ended up $55,000 and they would give you a uh, they were going to give me a, a brand new Mustang, which was in 64, that was the first year of the Mustang. And had I been a mature young man who would take good care of that car, and uh, it would have been worth a lot more than what I took, which was the alternative, which was a scholarship where you could go to school during the off season and they would pay $1,000 a semester for your schooling. And so because my dad uh, had insisted that I go to school during the off season anyway. Um, you know, he was practical and he was a businessman and he said, you know, the odds of you making the major leagues aren't that good. If you do, you're probably not going to make enough to retire. You're going to need an education anyway. And you're 17, you can't sign unless I sign too. And I'm not going to sign unless you promise me you'll go to college. And so, I ended up with $55,000 and a scholarship for eight years of college at $1,000 a semester. And that's where I started. Oh, it was a great place to start, and, uh, you know, to, to get up into the major leagues and pitch on my 18th birthday and strike out Willie Mays. It's a, you know, it's a Cinderella story. It, I wish it would have gone on longer and I hadn't had arm trouble and I could have pitched more and more and won more games, but uh, I can't look back and have one single regret. It's been great and uh, there were a lot of other moments like that that I was able to enjoy that a lot of people could only dream about. And, you know, 
a lot of things that I did too that probably I wouldn't have done if I'd have been a good boy and gone to college and not gone into the major leagues and hung around with a bunch of dirty old men. <laughs> so. Yeah, Lance? Um, do you have any stories or a story uh, involving Mickey Herskowitz? Mickey Herskowitz? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that first year, I pitched three innings against the Giants, um, and then we went on the road, and uh, I got into a game in relief against uh, the Giants again at Candlestick Park, and then uh, I got into another game in the last series of the year, which they were playing in Los Angeles, which was my hometown, so I had a lot of my friends out there and my family and everything, and I, I got into the game again, and... Uh, I pitched five innings in that game and didn't give up any runs. So at the end of it, I'd pitched nine innings and given up two runs. Um, but in that game, I struck out Frank Howard twice. I don't know how many of you remember Frank Howard, but he was three inches taller than me and 50 pounds heavier, and it was all muscle. And I'd never seen anybody like that in the batter's box before. So I struck him out a couple of times, and, and Mickey Herskowitz came up after the game and he said, well, Larry, you, you pitched against Frank Howard. What was that like? And I said, it was scary. Uh, I said, he was so big. I didn't know. I, he said, well, uh, how did you strike him out? And I said, well, you know, I had been talking to my brother, and, and he was saying, you know, that Howard, if you, if you have to face Howard, throw him a lot of breaking balls in the dirt because he'll swing at any kind of breaking ball down in the dirt. So I threw him sliders down and away, down in the dirt, and he swung at him, and that's how I struck him out. <laughs> and, and Mickey said, well, you struck out Frank Howard on a scouting report from your brother? <laughs> he said, how old is your brother? And I said, 14. <laughs> Mickey was such a great guy. I don't know, you, you, a lot of you probably followed his columns over the years, but uh, there was a time when, when Hal was covering and, and Mickey and John Wilson and a lot of the uh, other writers where they, they had a certain respect and admiration for the players and they didn't really uh, try to dig up any dirt and if they happened to see some, they ignored it. And so they were allowed to make, to present sports in the sports page as if it were more innocent than it really was. Uh, and now, with the unseemly things, with the steroids and the, uh, a lot of the things that the current players get involved in, they're all fighting for that story. They're not gonna ignore it, they're looking for it. And uh, Mickey was the master of them all in terms of having the respect of a player. You knew you could tell him anything and everything and tell him the truth and whatever he wrote you would be happy to read it. And uh, that's not always the case with the guys that cover these days. Larry, are you free to comment on the current Astros? Well, yeah, I can comment on the current Astros. <laughs> I can't I comment know. very, very, um, with, with a whole lot of specifics because I'm really not in the in crowd out there anymore. Um, but, I can say that uh, they've surprised me by losing so many games these last three years. Uh, we never lost 100 games, even when we were the Colt 45s and we were an expansion team. Uh, even the first year, we finished ahead of the Cubs, and, and it was the first year of the expansion team, and the Cubs had been around for 100 years. Well, not 100, but at that time, they have been around for about 70 years. Um, so, yeah, I was surprised when we lost 100. I, didn't, I would have been willing to bet anybody the second year that we wouldn't lose 100, not because I thought we were going to be good. I just didn't think it was really, I thought it was almost impossible to lose 100 games, no matter how bad you were. And after two years, I would have bet again last year that, that we wouldn't lose 100 games. And this year, I, will, I would bet again that we won't lose 100 games. But the, the difference this year is that in the beginning, the owner said, uh, our farm system is in a shambles. We're gonna have to trade any players that have value and get young players in return. We're gonna have to do as well as we can in the draft and we're gonna have to rebuild through the farm system and it may take a while. 
and I, I hope that you will be patient with us because we think that in the end it will pay off, which was exactly the right thing to say and do. And that's exactly what we've said and, and done up to this day. Uh, but what I've read in the paper from the owner leads me to believe that he's beginning to get impatient. And I think with the, the problems they've run into with the Comcast TV deal um, have been a big factor in that because I think they thought they were going to make a lot of money off of that and I think they're, they're not making anywhere near as much if not losing money in any way. It's just what he bought wasn't what he thought he was getting and so now I think he's getting a little impatient. Well, the general manager who has been building through the farm system, his history is in the farm system and in the amateur draft and I think his marching orders in the beginning was to let's build a team for the future. Well, this offseason, he started signing some guys that are 29 or 30 that have three or four years in the major leagues that have had a big season or two that may be coming off an injury. Or, but he started to spend some money on guys that have had significant su success in the major leagues. That's not going to get us over the hump. I doubt if it's going to get us to even where we could play 500 ball. But I'd be willing to bet it'll get us to the point where we won't lose 100 games. We're going to have more veteran players that have physical talent. The last couple of years, we've just had a bunch of young guys that have some talent, a whole bunch of AAA guys that with any other team, they'd be in AAA with us. They're in the major leagues. And, and the, the nice thing about that is that our, there are a handful of them that I think have proven that they could be uh, maybe a platoon partner at a certain position or a good bench player for a specific purpose, but not a guy to tie down a position and maybe make an all-star team. Uh, if you're going to get back in, in a position where you are contending for the playoffs in September, uh, you have to be able to match up with most of the teams you play at at least six positions and be better in a few of them. And you have to have a good bench and you have to have a good starting rotation, at least three deep, maybe four, and a good bullpen. It's not like the Rockets, you know, where you have three or four good players. If you can add four more, you're there. In, in baseball or football, I think it's going to be a long haul for the Texans, too. Yeah. You know, they got a 40-man roster. We got 25. When there's that many things that you need to fix, it takes a long time. But I don't think what they've done so far this winter is going to sabotage their ultimate goal, which is to build through the farm system and, and come up with a good young team because uh, the, the most recent TV deal is giving each team an extra $25 million to spend. And I think they pretty much spent it uh, on the acquisitions they've made this off season. So I think they'll be better. I don't think they'll be in contention in September but uh, it'll probably be easier to watch. Um, it's, just, it's just hard. I know how you feel because believe me, you can feel it 10 times over when you're in the broadcast booth. You can almost hear the people switching to a different station. You know, you get behind three or four runs and you've lost five in a row and you're thinking, what can I say to keep these people watching this game or listening to this game? And yet you know there are still people out there that are diehard fans and they won't give up. And if they're not going to give up and they're going to sit there and listen to every game while you lose 100 games or more, if you're in the booth, you've got to do your best to make the game as good as it can be for them. And so, yeah, I think they'll be a little better, but they're still not going to be what you want them to be. Well, the comment was that the American League is tougher than the National League, and that may be true overall. I, I think that the American League East is probably the toughest uh, division in baseball. But last year, uh, the National League Central was a tougher division than the American League West. The Astros actually got into a division that everyone thought would be a lot tougher. And as it turned out, the Cardinals were good, the Reds were good, and the Pirates came together in the kind of way that I hope we're going to come together two or three years from now with a lot of great young players. And so you had three teams in the National League Central that won more than 90 games. And uh, that was better than the American League West where the Astros were. 
So, you know, you can't, when I was playing, uh, our best years, talent-wise, were the late 60s, early 70s, and it was always the big red machine of the Dodgers. And we were in the same division, and there were several years when I thought we were good enough to win the East. Uh, a couple of years the Mets won it, I think in 72 or 3 with an 81 in, in 77 years, 78, 1 and 1. Anyway, 81, 79, they were just two games over 500 and they won the East. We could have won that division that year, but we weren't in that division. And so there, there's some luck to it, whatever sport you're in. As we come through these football playoffs, people are talking about, you know, some team had an easier way to get there than another team did because the NFL or the AFL is better than the other one. And as a player or a broadcaster or, or whatever your position is with the team, you can't do very much about what division you're in. You just have to, to try to make the best of what's in front of you. And uh, the one thing you certainly don't want to do is make excuses. I don't think anybody likes that. Well, technology, you know, I mean, we can't even figure out how to take a picture over here with our new iPhone. Um, you know, this is a, it, it's the, tech, the technology advances are, are certainly more um, accessible to younger people with pliable brains and more, uh, you know, a whole network of friends that are also using the th same things that can help them out and everything. And uh, technology, uh, and baseball analytics has grown a lot. You know, Moneyball was quite popular, uh, uh, talking about the things that you could do by understanding statistics beyond the statistics we were used to. And most teams were doing that um, at that time. And most teams are doing it even more now. The question was, could you go too far? And can you get to the point where you're relying only on quantifying uh, a human being rather than judging him not only in terms of how you quantify his performance but by what does he add as a human being to your team what does he or does he detract from your team is he the kind of guy that's going to rally around and be positive and, and guys will do better is he the kind of guy that uh, is always complaining and and demanding favors and everything, making a lot of money and showing up late. You know, there's a lot to being on the field and in the locker room uh, that I think has value. And, and so I say, yes, I think you can go too far. I think you could put together a team full of whiners and complainers that had numbers that were unassailable and that team couldn't win. Uh, so I think you could also put together a team full of guys that were great ball players that had good numbers and were great guys that, that worked together well and they could beat a team that had better numbers if you wanted to just run the analytics. One more. Okay, I'm going to be quick on instant replay because we, we, we don't have much time. But instant replay for me, uh, there's one thing they could do that I would support um, and I don't think it'll happen because I don't, the umpires just wouldn't accept it. I think they should use the little box they put on TV uh, for the strike zone. If I were a pitcher, I would want that box there because I know that box would be in the same place every time. Yeah. Now that umpire is going to call this pitch right at low and away at the knees a strike one time and a ball the next time. And I don't want that. As a pitcher, I want to know what the strike zone is. And if I hit it, I hit it. If I don't, I don't. And if I'm a hitter, I want to know the same thing. I don't want to take this pitch on two and two and have it be three and two and then take the same pitch on the next pitch and have them call it a strike. And so for me, yeah, instant replay, I, that, wouldn't even, that wouldn't make the game any longer. It wouldn't take any, you wouldn't be studying a, you know, a play to see if a guy missed the base or missed the tag or something. You just put a little buzzer and the, the home plate umpire's back pockets and zoop, you know it's a ball it's a strike 
Well, you know, like I said, the umpires won't, wouldn't like it, and that's why it won't happen. But the, the hitters and the pitchers would like it. Yeah, well, I, I think so. You know, really, it, if that were happening, they wouldn't even need the box. But for now, I think it, it's nice to look at it because you can see the human element of how they miss pitches and how, you know, just how it is. And that was that way when I pitched. I knew there were pitches that were strikes that they called balls. There were some that I went, mm, thank you very much. I knew it was a ball, but he called it a strike. Uh, it would be a better game if the strike zone was the same all the time. Thank you all for, for your attendance and everything. Enjoy talking with you. Thank you so much. You weren't supposed to get that on the first try. <laughs> to the guests. A wild guess. <laughs> short business meeting right now, but I'm sure the people will have the questions. So uh, if you need to go, you are free to go, but we would love to have you stick around if, if there are other questions that you might uh, find interesting and uh, I know some of the people would like to uh, visit with you as well so thank you again for your talk it was great having you here and uh, Judy thank you for coming oh also. thank you for inviting me as you know uh, you may not know 